let me first share this. This is a little box I have on the wall here in my uh, home office in uh, far away Antwerp in Belgium, uh, let's say. It, 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 it resonated with me a long time ago when I, when I saw it, so I bought it. I don't know who the quote is from, but I like it um, because it, it says a lot, I believe. The fact that life is not about just finding yourself. It's not like looking for who you sort of really are. Life is more or even all about creating yourself. And that, that applies for me to so many things. It makes no point just to sit around waiting for things to happen, blaming other people for things that are happening or not happening to you. It doesn't make sense. And, and then if you think about this, that just applies to uh, life in general, but also to Scrum and Agile. How many people do you know um, that are uh, involved in adopting Scrum or in Agile transformations that just seem to sit around waiting for things to happen rather than stepping up, doing something, taking action? Do, even, even the smallest step might even help. So, so I would also say that Scrum is not just about finding it. It will not just magically happen. Scrum is about creating it. So create your own versions of Scrum. Now, in, in my case of, uh, of life and my life with Scrum, um, I hope a lot of people realize that Scrum is turning 25 years old this month. So quite, quite amazing. Um, I've, I've been fortunate to uh, have been working with Scrum for more than 17 years now. So uh, I started back in September, October 2003. And, and the lovely thing is, uh, for me at least, uh, my life of Scrum didn't start with Scrum. It started with something that was called extreme programming. Now, and, and it, it didn't stop there. So we added Scrum afterwards. And, and throughout that journey of 17 years, I felt there's been multiple times that I had to sort of rethink myself, rethink who I am, um, reinvent almost myself. Although my, my, my beliefs and views on Scrum overall have remained quite stable. So, but it, it's also about creating, finding yourself. And, and it helped me discover for myself that I, I, I like to see myself as what I call an, a Scrum caretaker, um, even an independent Scrum caretaker to make clear that I'm not connected to any sort of fixed type organization. Um, trying to be totally on my own two feet, that, that helped me the most. So in, in 2013, around the time that I wrote my, my first book, I uh, left uh, a large consulting organization. I was doing a lot of work in the Netherlands um, and I started my own little company, which is like you said, Cora, thank you, um, ULIZ Inc. Um, and, and then uh, the first thing I did, I partnered exclusively with Ken Schreiber and Scrum.org, so the organization of Ken. And in 2016, I uh, decided to be out there again, uh, more in the world again, let's say. And I had to think of a title for myself, because you all know that uh, LinkedIn asks you to enter a job title, a position, and so on. Now, I had a company, but it was just a one-person company. It was just me, nobody else. So I could have given myself fancy titles like the CEO of my company, but I was also the CFO of the company. I was also the marketing director of my company. I was also the help desk agent and the support agent of my company. So I decided to let, let's just go intuitively. I, I, I like intuition a lot. Let's go intuitively for something that I feel reflects who I am. That's why I call myself a scrum caretaker. And, and it's not just about taking care of Scrum, because I, I love Scrum, 17 years, still passionate about it. It's a caretaker for me also reflects the, the people part of Scrum, the human part. It's not just taking care of Scrum, it's also caring about people and caring about the people in Scrum. And, and if there's anything I think that we should do uh, together as, as Scrum practitioners across the world, is to focus that people aspect more and more and more. Because the process aspect of Scrum, we've, we're getting that through. So if, if 25 years of Scrum has done anything, 
It's to help people shift from predictive management to empirical management. So that's great. But let's, let's start using Scrum, not just to build excellent products, but also help people develop themselves. And that's why I call that, that I say that I'm on a journey of humanizing the workplace with Scrum. It's an endless journey. It's an infinite journey. It will never come to an end and it will never be successful. But I will never be able to humanize all, all workplaces across the world. But I believe that we can do much. And it's not, it's, it's good that it's infinite. It's, it's not supposed to be a finite game. It's not a war. It's not about winning or losing. It's about having having some sort of purpose. And again, that connects to life is about creating yourself. I found over time that 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 people aspect for me is at the heart of everything I do. That was even before school. It just, just took some time to be able to, to realize that. Now that there's been evolutions in the Scrum world, obviously. Scrum itself has not drastically changed. Although if you would read the first paper about Scrum 1995, that, that's still quite, quite different. It's sort of a sign of the times, let's say. Um, there's been a beautiful paper about Scrum being a pattern language, 1998, so three years later. Uh, but, but around the time of the Agile Manifesto and afterwards, uh, Ken publishing his first book, Scrum started, started taking the, the, the shape that it has to do. So that, that, that's cool, that's lovely. Now, remember in those times, Agile Manifesto 2001, I think Ken's first book, um, Agile Software Development with Scrum 2002. I started with this thing back in 2003. Those were days, at least in where I worked by then, it was Belgium, um, that we didn't use the name Scrum. We didn't use the name Extreme Programming. We didn't use the name or the term Agile because nobody knew what it was. Back in 2003, we gave it all funny names. We tried to present it in different names and so on. It was only since, let's say 2005, 2006 that we started using those names because people started realizing it and, and recognizing it. So that, that was cool. And that was also around the time that uh, Ken, Ken Schwebert introduced the idea of Scrum Bird um, because he was uh, traveling the world doing classes. I had my first Scrum Master class with Ken Schwaber back in May 2004. So imagine that's uh, 16 years and a half ago. Um, <coughs> so Ken was traveling the world, uh, a really tiring journey, um, doing classes, getting the idea of, cross, uh, of Scrum. He created the certification to get more people to attend classes so that he could um, so, so merge them into Scrum, let's say. Uh, the certification was, in, in a sense, only an excuse to do that, um, which is, by the way, a very good excuse. And, and after a while, I think he was sort of fed up with the idea that people said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was asking people, do you do Scrum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? Just that, that thing, daily Scrum, that's too much for us. It's too frequent. There are too, me too many meetings in Scrum. So we do our uh, daily Scrum like twice a week. Okay, oh, and, and what else? Yeah, you know what, that product owner thing, I know it's, it's, it's very difficult to get somebody to do that. Uh, so yes, we, we use Scrum, but you know what, the product owner thing, we'll add that later on. So, and, 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 and Ken was so, sort of, let's say in a way, maybe fed up with it. And he, and he created the Scrum bot thing. Oh yeah, yes, we do Scrum, but not that aspect of Scrum and, and then a sort of workaround. Is, is how we do that. Now, I, I, I honestly am not too sure that that was really most helpful approach. It, it did help getting the idea across of how, how minimalist Scrum actually is, um, well, because that is the strange contradiction with Scrum. It's a very lightweight framework. It has only a minimal set of instructions and, and, and let's say prescriptions, um, but, but even then, that seems to be too difficult. So it's so minimal, and yet people have this tendency to, to, to leave out stuff. Now, um, when, when I was working um, still at, at a large consulting company around 2000 and 2011, um, 2010, 2011, 2012, so I was following up with uh, the evolutions of the Talk. 
Scrum the Talk was founded back in 2009. I'd been keeping up with everything they were doing. Um, I was I was working at that large consulting uh, organization, and I was also already working with Scrum uh, and with Ken. Uh, I, I, I do remember at the time, by the way, I was I was combining three full time jobs at some point in time. I was what they called the uh, global agile and scrum leader uh, within that uh, international consulting company. I was doing a lot of trainings uh, by then because I had been uh, had become a professional scrum trainer uh, by then, and 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 I was working already almost full. -time full-time with, with Ken Schrader and Alex Armstrong by then on maintaining courseware. That was beautiful days. But I was I was in touch with Ken a lot. So, and back in 2011, 2012, we were talking about this Scrum butt thing. And I was raising some concerns on, let's say, the helpfulness. Because by that time, Scrum was already the most adopted method around the world for at least age of software development, if not age of development and product development in general. I was like, yeah, but you know what? Even in those days, most people were doing some form of Scrum. I, I, I like to say at least something that looks like Scrum. But the idea of Scrum bots became like very judgmental, very, very almost arrogant, blaming people, judging people. And, and both Ken and I don't like that. So we, we thought about a new way to express what should be about Scrum. And, and as Scrum was the most adopted method around the world, and still is today, by the way, um, around 2012, um, we decided to try to shift from Scrum but to Scrum and. The sort of idea um, that we also see in the attitude, the stance as human beings, as, as people, in whatever we do, um, are you a yes and person or are you a yes but person? By that, we had exercises in the class, by the way, try organizing a party from a yes, but stance. So, yeah, let's do a party. Yes, but there's this problem, but there's that problem, and so on. That just wouldn't work. You would never organize a real party. It would at least not be fun. So try organizing a party. Try using Scrum from a yes and perspective. Oh yes, we're doing Scrum. And if we would do this, it might be even greater. Yes, if we would have blue and so on. So that's sort of the idea of Scrum and. So uh, we say, yes, we do Scrum. Yes, we use Scrum. We've got, in a way, we've got all of the elements of Scrum somewhat in place. And here's our way to try to get more out of Scrum. Now, back in, back in uh, 2013, when I wrote my book, uh, Scrum, a pocket guide, I, I used a somewhat different language for that. And I'd like to talk about that today. I, I called it tactics. You've got the rules of Scrum, the rules of the game, and you've got tactics to apply the game. And, and that, that, that what helped me a lot. And, and at some point in time, I must say, it, it may be strange to talk about the topic uh, Scrum end and to say that I've actually stopped using it a little bit. Why? Because it was, yes, we use Scrum, and here's how we're trying to get more out of it. And that turned into an excuse for uh, people to turn it into a sort of um, maturity model, um, an excuse to start adding stuff on top of Scrum. So rather than keeping Scrum lightweight, adding stuff and making it heavy again, which was not the idea. Uh, some people tried to turn it into some sort of organizational uh, things and so on. In, in a way, uh, we've tried to counter that with what we created at Scrum the Talk Agility Path. But still, I, I, I feel the term has lost a lot of its, its power and meaning uh, by that. So, so I started calling it Tactics. It's from my first book, Scrum, a Pocket Guide. Uh, I wrote a book back in 2013. I want, I, want to, I want to use this occasion to share that I'm working on a new book. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the, the sharing uh, afterwards. I'm working on a new book of Scrum. Um, so in 2013, published this book, 2019. In 2020, I don't know if I've been seen this, I published a new book about Scrum. It's not really my book. 97 things every Scrum practitioner should know. I am now working on a third book. It's, it's uh, for the time being called Views from the House of Scrum. And, 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 and this is sort of... Um, 
opportunity for you. This is the first time ever I'm publicly announcing this. And, and I would like to read one little part of my book. And, and that part is called Ways to Play the Game. And, and it, it covers what I mean with those rules and tactics. So, so um, listen in a little bit. So ways to play the game. Let me read a little bit and then we'll come back. Within the boundaries of Scrum, of the game of Scrum, players need to decide how they will play the game. We distinguish the roles of Scrum from tactics to apply those rules. Tactics as ways to play the game should be selected, tried and tested, made right size and fitted to context and circumstances, or be abandoned. Yeah. So, so given Scrum's widespread adoption, an inclusive language and stance are most helpful. That's why in 2012, we decided to go for Scrum End. It is more inclusive. It attracts people, it's more inclusive. So rather than blaming or judging some for what they not do or not do enough, much more people are out there that need our help in getting more from their Scrum. The way forward is presenting Scrum's minimalist design as a gateway to a myriad of options that can be unleashed. That sort of positive, inclusive attitude. Scrum replaces and has replaced the traditional predictive plan-driven approach with well-considered experimentation and self-organization to better deal with uncertainty and unpredictability. Scrum helps people to uphold transparency over the work being undertaken and over the resulting outcomes, to embrace reality for forward-looking decisions, to adjust, to adapt, to gain inflexibility. All rules, roles and principles of the Scrum framework serve this purpose. As a whole, and that's the clue, as a whole, the rules, roles, principles and values of Scrum, they form the base setup to the game of Scrum. They are the boundaries within which to play. They form, to speak, the, the playing field, the field where we play. But that's all, just the rules. Doesn't describe how to play. Because similar to all games and team sports, all play upon the same rules, yet some are more successful than others. It depends on many factors, but one of them is the tactics used to play. So important benefits depend on choosing and combining tactics wisely, on making tactical choices. It's not just the rules, look beyond the rules, it's how you apply the rules. So, and, and then tactics are not practices for work domains and activities that are not covered by Scrum. So tactic is not, tactics is not an excuse to start adding things to Scrum. Uh, such, tact, such, such practices on top of Scrum, um, they might be called complementary practices, but they are beyond, beyond the boundaries of the game. In, in that sense, they are outside of the play field. They have in themselves nothing to do with Scrum in a way. Scrum instead can wrap, like wrapping. Scrum can wrap many practices to apply the rules. Scrum is minimal yet sufficient. You don't have to add stuff to that. Observation shows how difficult that is. All too often, Scrum is being burdened by stacking practices, rules, phases, roles on top of Scrum. The challenge is to keep the overall system of Scrum consistent and cohesive, lightweight, nimble, and recognizably Scrum. A lot of those things uh, twist Scrum. So tactics make out a specific manifestation of Scrum. So what Scrum describes in the Scrum guide are just the rules. Every actual implementation of Scrum can look differently, and it should look differently. It's still Scrum, it's recognizably Scrum, but it's a specific manifestation. Yeah, and, and the openness of Scrum, being not upfront, instructing specific tactics, you will not find any tactics in the Scrum Guide, implies that the players themselves 
explore, uncover, discover, tune, and tweak tactics, options, patterns, rather than make themselves dependent on external instructions or instructors. Think again, life or Scrum, much like life, is not about finding it, it's about creating it yourself. That makes it not easy, but it's the only good path that we should take. That requires thought and discipline. It is easier, it's more convenient to rely on external parties or uh, methodological prescriptions, but that would not help if you want to optimize for value in your specific context at your specific time. Scrum is a framework. Yeah. And then, then complexity comes into play because it means that individual tactics applied to individual elements of Scrum in themselves as individual tactics might not immediately result in improved agility or improved ability to deliver value. A combination of tactics might, or the improvement might just lag. There might be some, some delay. And again, complexity, so reversely, Increased agility can rarely be attributed to one tactical choice alone. So be careful about trying to go for hyper-specialization again in, in that sense. So that was a little part of, of my book. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share this as a PDF, this one article with, uh, with Koa. So you all can have access already to my book. A little bit of this one article. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to uh, finalize the book by the end of the year. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, I, I, I don't like deadlines. Um, creating yourself doesn't happen against, let's say, deadline. So that was a little, little one view of my book. It's from uh, the uh, second chapter. It's called Rules and Tactics, what I just talked about. And there's a writing, uh, there's a typo in my presentation. Oh, my God. Ways to play the game. And just, just to highlight a little bit, it's in progress. These are the rules of the game. As I don't know how familiar you are with, with football or soccer, but the rules of the game um, give you instructions on the play field and, and what players are allowed or not allowed to do. In football, a goalkeeper can touch the ball with his hands, but not outside of that, that big area. Other players cannot touch the ball with their hands. You can't, you can't uh, just tackle people viciously, that sort of thing. Within that, it's about strategies. Who, who's going to do what at what point in time if certain things might happen? You can't predict that. You need intelligent, creative people to, to deal with that. So let me, let me go into that a little bit more. So the rules of the game are actually quite simple. So that, that play field, it's quite clear. It's got uh, some events. It's got some uh, roles, um, accountabilities in place and, and what they do. So let me quickly go through that. So, in, uh, the, so despite the horrible situation of the COVID, and, and uh, some countries might be suffering from storms, it seems. So, Shirley, I hope you're safe uh, when a storm comes up. I hope you're all safe in Vietnam with the storm that has uh, have come over your country. So we, we live to difficult times. Um, sometimes difficult times are also an opportunity to sort of reinvent yourself. So when in March, April, all of my work got cancelled because of uh, because of COVID. My assignments, uh, my classes suddenly were just cancelled. Um, I decided to just lay, lay low a little bit for a while at least. And, and again, I started writing and I created a paper, which is called Moving Your Scrum Downfield. Again, Scrum and Life is about creating yourself. And after uh, 20, 25 years of Scrum, I think it's time to get sort of unstuck over um, debating details of the rules of Scrum, uh, whatever, whatever nitty gritty things, uh, trying to interpret the words of the Scrum Guide. Let's, let's look at intent and purpose of the Scrum Guide rather than being fixated on, on the exactness of the rules and the prescriptions. And so, so I started creating it. So it's time in a way to start moving our Scrum downfield. So I wrote a paper, it's called Moving Your Scrum Downfield, literally. I did that in April. And in, in that paper, I described six essential traits to the game of Scrum. Again, building again on that analogy where Scrum originally was from, you know, the game of rugby. 
a team sport, you move as a unit up the field uh, to make the best possible progress together, um, helping out each other, taking over from each other, learning new stuff and, and so on. So let's uh, building on that game analogy that was sort of initially in Scrum and that is in my book, uh, my book Scrum and Pocket Guide. So decided let's 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 create some sort of description of the rules of Scrum and let, let's make it barely and 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 minimal. And so that's Scrum in a nutshell. And in a nutshell, it means that the Scrum master fosters an environment where and then repeatedly, meaning iteratively, incrementally, a product owner will order business functions, business solutions, business challenges. He will order them, he or she will order them for value against an overarching product vision. And, and that's how it is in my paper. I just added uh, that he or she does that in a product backlog to that just for uh, this presentation. And then the Scrum team creates valuable increments of work. So pulling work from that product backlog into a sprint backlog and using that to create valuable increments of work against an overarching sprint goal. And then all players figure out what to work on next, what is most important to do now, and how, how can we best organize for that? In general, in terms of standards, practices, again, tactics. So that's just the essence of Scrum. Those are the rules of Scrum, sort of the, 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 the play field of Scrum. Yeah? And, and then what I call tactics. So how to apply the rule. Let me, let me give some examples of, of tactics. Hope, hope that you will get this. Um, a very important tactic and, and one or at least tactical choice. And, and that is the one that is missing, I would almost say everywhere when, when on companies adopt and introduce Scrum, is knowing your product. Scrum has a product owner. Scrum has a product backlog. Scrum is rooted in that uh, paper from 1986 that introduced the game analogy, the team sports analogy, the new, new product development game. So Scrum is a way to organize for a uh, complex work, often product development. So knowing the product and a product might be a real product, traditional product, it might be a service, it might be a digital product, it might be a digital service, again, intent and purpose. But knowing the product is important. It's a tactical choice on how to organize your Scrum. Most, certainly large organizations I know, they are working on very small parts of products. Nobody's minding the overall end-to-end -end value stream or the, the delivery of value, uh, overall start to finish for end users, consumers, and so on. So knowing the product, that will define the scope, the span of your backlog. It will define the mandate, the decision uh, mandate, the ownership of the product owner. So knowing the product is a really important choice to make. It's a tactic to apply. Yeah? Uh, development practices, important tactics. Like I said, my life with Scrum did not start with Scrum. I, I like to say that I'm fortunate for it. Why? Because it started with extreme programming, which has an amazing, powerful set of development practices. Pair programming, test-driven development, continuous integration, refactoring, you, you name it. Um, you can development practices as a tactic to apply within Scrum. Again, it's, it's Scrum can wrap many practices. That, that, those are tactics to play the game. They don't change the um, how Scrum looks like, how Scrum feels like. It's the resulting system is still recognizably Scrum. So development practice nowadays, DevOps, that might be a strategy to, to apply to your development uh, within Scrum. So DevOps is a, is, a, is a set of practices, a culture, a mindset that can be wrapped by Scrum. Um, CI, continuous integration, uh, CD, continuous uh, delivery, all beautiful modern uh, development practices sets that can be wrapped by Scrum. But you apply them within Scrum. Yeah, um, Removing the tea leaves. It's a sort of analogy that I have. It's also going to be in my new book, by the way. Uh, so keeping your product backlog almost minimal. Yeah. Um, in that sense, removing the tea leaves. I don't know how 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 much you like drinking a, a cup or a glass of tea, but imagine you have a glass of tea. And you've got um, if you're working with a tea bag for that, and and the tea bag is torn, and you've got tea leaves in your tea. 
what would you do with those two leaves? You would remove them because they make a messy, a messy product. It's not a tasty product anymore. Because what's the problem with tea leaves? Uh, once you leave your cup alone, they sink to the bottom. Yeah, still not nice, but at least they're at the bottom. You pick up your glass to drink, or you stir it, or whatever, and they they come up again. That's a messy product. You re, you would remove the tea leaves. Do the same with your product backlog. If you have all those things somewhere um, at the bottom of your product backlog that only come up because you start stealing things, but in the end you don't do them anyhow, you don't drink them, they float again to the to the bottom, get them out. It's 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 an implementation of the idea of maximizing the work not done. That is a tactic. That is a tactic to manage your product backlog. Scrum only said you need a product backlog in place with an ordered list of work that is deemed valuable by the product owner. Uh, Scrum doesn't describe how, what sort of rules, uh, tactics to use to manage your product backlog. Well, remove the tea leaves. That's a great idea. Um, user studies. Are you using user studies for your product backlog? Yes, no. Maybe user studies are more like requirement stuff. Maybe that's more on the side of development. Maybe, maybe uh, your product owner would be better off keeping product backlog up to the level of really business challenges, business um, problems, things that the product owner would like to see solved and then work with the development team on how to further decompose that into work. It's, it's a tactic that applies to not just how to, um, what to put on your product backlog, but also how to act as a product owner and what sort of relationship to establish with the development team. Visualizing progress. Um, are you using a burn down chart? Are you using a burn up chart? Are you using a cumulative flow diagram? Um, are you actually visualizing progress at the product backlog level, which is something that is really missing with a lot of organizations? It's why I, in, in, in the second edition of my, my book, I reintroduced the idea of release burn down chart. Despite it's a horrible title, release burn down chart, but it's still is a very useful thing, a burnout chart at product backlog level. Um, are you using a scrum board or a spin burnout chart? How are you, that's a tactic, that's a tactical choice. Scrum only says to have a product backlog and a spin backlog in place and to manage progress and, and visualize that. Well, how to do that? Are you using a scrum board and a spin burnout chart? That's overhead, they serve the same purpose, make a choice, maximize the work not done again. Yeah. Are you using story points for estimates? Are you using something else, t-shirt sizing, uh, animal sizing, whatever you run into? Um, are you using, are you working with something like philosophy? Philosophy is not mandatory in Scrum. It's a tactic. It's, it's a sort of practice within Scrum that, that covers what the Scrum Guide calls past performance. It's not even mandatory. It's not a mandatory practice. Use it as a tactic to get more out of, out of the game. And if it doesn't work, abandon it. Yeah. Uh, planning poker for a good tactic to do collective uh, estimation yeah, against a shared understanding. Are you doing your daily scrum standing up? That's a tactical choice. It's tactic to apply. Scrum only says to have a daily scrum. We like you to know the purpose of the daily scrum more than how you would want to do it. That's your choice. You can do your, your uh, daily scrum running around. You can do it hanging upside down. You can do it by taking a walk outside, which, by the way, is a really good idea. Yeah? So there's so many things, so many tactics to apply. So the, the rules of scrum are very simple. The, the benefits, the advantages you will get out of your scrum will largely depend on the tactics you choose to apply. And that's a choice. Scrum cannot tell you what you should do, how you should do that. You should make that uh, fit to your context and, and even at the timing. Tactic, how, how to deal with the rules. Are, are the uh, accountabilities of Scrum as, as, as defined by Scrum, are you enacting them full time? Or do you also have to combine it with other jobs? Or do you also have to be part of uh, different teams and different projects? So are you full-time context switching? Yes, no. Tactics on how to, how to apply the roles, the accountabilities defined with Scrum. Product backlog refinement. I describe it in, in my book as it's a tactic. It is not necessarily mandatory. It, is, it might be helpful, but I see nowadays 
that way too many teams, way too many organizations pay way too much time on product backlog refinement. Trust yourself, believe in yourself. You can do this with only doing scrum sprints and sprint planning to get all the work identified that you need to do. So I would prefer to take more time for sprint planning and you can take up to eight hours, by the way, rather than doing too much product backlog refinement and thereby try to limit your sprint planning to just half an hour. Uh, so that's a sort of uh, not so really great. Now, now um, as the last thing, what, what I've called in my, in my article, what I've called complementary practices. Complementary practices are practices for which Scrum has no rule, no artifact, no event, no accountability in place. Yeah? So, so use story mapping uh, sort of between brackets. You could say that as a possible visualization of your product backlog, but still it, it's not an ordered thing. Useful, not prescribed by Scrum business modeling, how to do market research, how to conceive your products, how to do competitive analysis, how to check in with customers about customer satisfaction, business cases, all those things, a lot of product management work. It's, it's a complementary practice. It's something you do outside of the play field. It's not something you do on the play field. So, and, and long time ago, the, those tactics, that was what I meant with Scrum and. Yes, we do Scrum and we know our product and our product is actually the end service. Or our product is an experience. Or our product is a product, actually a product bundle. Or our product is unfortunately just a little part of an existing product. It's a, it's a component and, and unfortunately thereby maybe our teams are also component teams. Yes, we do Scrum and you know what? We integrate our work on a, on a continuous basis so that we can achieve um, the, the, the level of the definition of DOM uh, faster, easier, with more feedback loops. Oh, yes, we do Scrum, and our product backlog is really, really minimal. And that's sufficient, that's enough. Yes, we do Scrum, and we use a Scrum, a scrum board to visualize the, the progress within, within a spin. You know, that was the idea of, of a Scrum end. And then it sort of got blown by people seeing it as, as maturity. Oh, yes, you do have to do Scrum. And then beyond this, you have to do. That was not really the idea. So, so, so the combination of the play field and the tactics, rules and tactics, that is what you need to maximize your Scrum. You don't have to add stuff to that. You don't necessarily have to scale Scrum. Maximize Scrum first, which is more helpful. So th th this is how I look at Scrum End, uh, a little bit of the history. And, and so I'll, I'll, I've, I'm, I'm trying to uh, stick to uh, the terminology I introduced with my book, Rules and Tactics. And the rest are complementary practices. This is beyond Scrum, the outside of, of the play field. So I wanna thank you very, very much for listening in. I hope it was useful. I, 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 I wanted to bring a little bit of clarity over what we mean with Scrum End, where it comes from, and how I, at least how I look at it nowadays. So rules and tactics, always keep going back. It's sort of, I, I know that Ken likes to use the analogy with a, a, a game of chess a lot. The game of chess, simple set of rules, an infinite um, possibility of combination of tactics. Oh yeah, first I make this move and then I make that move and so on. So look at it like that. Um, you've got a team of players on the field. They will decide how to move. They make sort of tactical choices, even potentially on the field. Yeah. So, so just think about it. And, and um, my only invitation is as a Scrum caretaker, um, keep creating yourself in a way, keep creating your Scrum, keep learning, keep improving, keep scrumming. Um, Join me in, in helping people moving their Scrum forward. Um, join me in, in using Scrum as a great tool to humanize the workplace.